Welcome to the Art of Photography. My name is Ted Forbes and today we're going to talk about the camera obscura. I figured this was a good subject to kick off our very first podcast with uh, since the camera obscura really predates what we consider to be the origins of photography. And let me show you what a camera obscura is. When we think of the invention of photography, we really think back to like the 1800s when guys like Fox Talbot were experimenting uh, with early image recording. But actually that's not really the birth of photography. What that is, is that's the birth of, of being able to record an image onto an emulsion that either sits on a piece of glass or a piece of paper to record that still. But actually photography base dates way back earlier than that with things like the camera obscura. In fact, there are uh, re record of, of people like even Greeks like Aristotle in the fourth century discussing this. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci discusses the camera obscura in his Codex Atlanticus. And uh, especially during the Renaissance, there are uh, some contested theories that, that some portrait painters, like people like Vermeer, were using kind of these light rooms to actually go in and trace the image. And that explained, uh, we do know that there were uh, experiments with optics going on at that time and that would explain some of the, um, uh, the great contrast in realistic detail um, from the artwork that was produced before the Renaissance. But either way, I'm going to show you what a camera obscura is and how it works because I think it really is the most basic, you know, this is how photography works and how images are captured. Okay, for this experiment, and I promise I won't turn into Mr. Science on every episode, but what we're going to do, and you can try this at home, it's pretty cool, you can take just a standard cardboard box, okay? I've got a cardboard box and I've cut a hole in it right here, okay? So what we're going to do is I'm going to take a simple camera lens and we're going to stick it in that hole. And what I'm going to do is project an image or project light onto the back of the box. This is how I'm going to do it. I've got a light bulb over here and this is actually, this is kind of a weird light and there's a reason I chose it. If you're going to do this at home, most light bulbs that you buy at, at the uh, hardware store come with a white coating on it and it's hard to see any detail through the white coating. I picked this example because it's a clear glass bulb and you can see the filament inside and you're going to be able to see that in a second. But it's pretty easy. Basically what happens is when I turn this on, I am actually using, I'm, I've got some light going here. I'm going to put the lens on the front of the box and we're going to simply hold it up and you can see that the image of the light bulb is projected and you can see some detail of the, uh, of the uh, stuff around the light bulb in this, uh, in this particular light projecting onto the back of the box. Okay, pretty simple. You might also, and it's harder to tell here because this is unconventional, but if you use a standard light bulb, you can see it. The image is actually projecting upside down. Okay, and I'm going to explain that in a minute when we talk about uh, pinholes. But um, essentially, there are three ways that you can manipulate light. Okay, the first one is reflection, the second one is projection, and the third one is refraction. Okay, reflection is pretty easy because we see it every morning when we get up and look in the mirror. A mirror is simply a way of reflecting, it's an optical illusion where you have have a, a, a smooth enough surface that's that's been optimized to have this optical illusion where you don't see the glass surface you see this artificial world beyond it which is the exact mirror opposite of what your world is that you're looking into obviously everyone knows what a mirror is but the other two ways of manipulating light what we're using right here is refraction we're using glass to manipulate the light to project the image onto the back of the box now you can also use the third type of manipulation which is simply projection Okay, now the other thing I've done to this box, other than cut a hole in the front, is I've actually taken a, a, um, a small pin and literally made a pinhole right here on the front of the box, as you can see. It's really tiny, okay? It's a small pinhole. Okay, now what we're going to do is do the same experiment. Now, obviously, the lens had... Um, was able to let more light in. This is called aperture. If you're not sure what that is, we'll talk about it uh, shortly. But uh, anyway, basically this is a smaller hole, so it's letting less light in. But you can still see, actually, that if I put this in front of the light, that we can see the light, or projected in this case, through the pinhole onto the back of the box with some detail. Okay, You don't necessarily need a lens to produce an image. Let me show you one other thing. We're going to take this a step further. I've got a um, just a regular white mailing envelope. Let's put this in here and see how this affects it. Okay, as you can see, it's now projecting onto the white envelope. The closer I move this white envelope towards the pinhole, okay, the smaller the image gets. It stays on there, it stays in focus because we have such a small aperture or opening, but you can see that the, um, the image actually is smaller the closer I get, and the further away I move, the bigger the image gets. This is what's known, boys and girls, as focal length, okay? Now, lenses on standard cameras, 
come in focal lengths. Okay, so if you have the small, the shorter the focal length, the wider the angle you're going to have. And let me explain how this works because it's kind of the opposite of the way things appear in real life. The closer something is, the bigger it is, right? It's the opposite through the pinhole or through the lens too. Uh, but anyway, when I'm really close, you can see it's really small. So more of the scene is going to uh, be projected onto whatever you're projecting onto it, be it film, this envelope, or a CCD, CCD in a digital camera. Anyway, you're going to get more of the scene on there. The further back I go, or the longer the focal length, I end up with kind of a macro or telephoto effect. So that's how focal length works. So essentially that is the camera obscura, and we did it with two, uh, two methods here. We used refraction to project our light onto the back, and we used standard projection to project the light on the back. In both cases, that image was upside down, and we know that because light, we know, travels in a straight line. So for instance, the top of the light bulb has to come down to go into the pinhole. The bottom of the light bulb has to come up to go through the pinhole. Okay, so if you continue up with that line, once it hits, comes through the pinhole and hits the back of the projection surface, in this case, it would be on the top and not the bottom, and vice versa for the top. So that's why you end up with a completely uh, kind of inverted image, if you will, when you look through here. So anyway, so that's how that works. In the next episode, we're going to talk about pinhole photography, which really I get excited about because pinhole photography is one of the most kind of early examples of... Um, of photography. It doesn't require lens. It's very lo-fi. You can get some really interesting effects with images and it's very inexpensive and easy to do. You can make your own cameras even. So anyway, that'll be next time, but um, that's all I got for today. Thanks for watching. I think it's impossible for us today to imagine what a revelation the first photographs would have been to people. These mirrors with a memory to record things that looked just like what we saw. People's ideas of time changed completely. For the first time, you would know what your grandparents looked like even if they died before you were born. To see this process make its place in the lives of ordinary people is to me the most exciting thing about it. It changed everything. In 1814, 1815, you have a man named Nesiphor Niepce. And what he discovered was that asphalt was sensitive to light. He paint the solution on a piece of glass and put an engraving on a piece of paper on top of that. And where the light shined through and exposed that asphalt, it hardened. If you put that piece of glass with the asphalt into a solvent, it will remove the areas that weren't hardened. The earliest photograph we know is on a piece of pewter made by Nesiphor Niepce. It's a view from a window. It's from the 1820s. And this image made by asphalt still exists. So that's, that's the invention of photography.
Nieps knows that he's onto something, and he takes Louis Daguerre on as a partner. Daguerre was well known in Paris in the 1820s, you know, well before the 1839 announcement of the daguerreotype. He was a showman. He ran this 75-foot diorama. Daguerre himself wants to make images. He understands how a camera obscura works. Nieps didn't have the money. He didn't have the youth. He didn't have the health. He really kick-started Daguerre. When Nieps died, uh, Daguerre continued his experiments on his own. By 1839, Daguerre has a, a system that is fully realized. It's perfect. It's a piece of copper coated with silver, and you have to polish it very well to the point where you have a polish that when you turn the plate towards a darkened room, it looks black. And it's fumed with iodine, and when you take it out of the box, it's yellow. That's silver iodide. The plate is then put into a camera obscura, or we would say camera now, but a camera obscura. Given enough time, it's exposed. When you take it out of the camera in, in a darkened room, there's nothing to see on the plate. Completely invisible, same yellow coating. But when you put it in another box with a little container of mercury and heat the mercury, the fumes of the mercury dance upon the plate. And when you withdraw that from the box, you have an image. You still have to fix the image. And fixing is a strange term. It basically means that you're preventing the plate from changing any more as light strikes the plate. And you place it into a solution that fixes it. It's something that we now all call hypo. The garotype is placed into a special case. It's designed to keep air away from the plate because air is what makes silver tarnish. Daguerre would give the process to the government. The government then would allow anyone in the world to do the daguerreotype, except England. And so if you wanted to make daguerreotypes in England, you had to pay a fee. This is the Giroud daguerreotype camera. It would be the world's first commercially manufactured and sold cameras. It's the camera, but it's also the system that goes with it that, that you need to process, sensitize and process the image. It's essentially an American phenomenon. It was the Americans that embraced it, that used it. It was Americans that were leaving home and striking out further and further west so that people could have something to uh, think about and to reflect on and to remember people by. We are in the uh, photography vault at George Eastman House. This is where all of our photo collections are stored. And here we have our wall of daguerreotypes. We have one of the largest collections of daguerreotypes in the world, over 3,500 daguerreotypes, including 1,500 French daguerreotypes, which is the largest collection of French daguerreotypes outside of France. The daguerreotype is a, both a negative and a positive image at the same time. Well, I think really to see a daguerreotype and get the full effect, you have to be holding it. It's an intimate thing, it's reflective, and sometimes you do see yourself, and that's kind of a, makes you part of the object. With daguerreotypes, there's infinite detail. There's something just so compelling about daguerreotypes. They're um, not made with the negative, so that daguerreotype plate was actually in the room with the person being photographed, so there's something of, I read as that person's energy on the plate. It's a very, very permanent process, much more so than, than all the processes we grew up with. I can take you to an antique shop that's uh, 15 minutes from here, and we can find a daguerreotype made in the 1850s. And guess what? They're still in perfect condition.
this time around the 1830s is really when photography comes together. Daguerre is in France making images with silver iodide on metal plates, and Talbot is working in England making images with silver chloride on paper. Working simultaneously in two different countries, not quite knowing about the other. But that changes when you start to have articles in the, the press, now it's public. And so a rivalry begins. William Henry Fox Talbot is a, a gentleman scholar in England living in an old abbey in the village of Laycock. He was a member of the House of Lords. He was a wealthy individual who had many, many interests. Talbot is on his honeymoon in Lake Como in Italy, and he's trying to make drawings with a camera lucida. He's trying to do pencil sketches and realize that he has no skill whatsoever in drawing. He wants to make pictures within a camera obscura. All he has to do is find the material that he can put into the back of the camera to, to record the image. Finally, when he returns home to Laycock Abbey, he starts doing experiments, and he is able to produce a photographic image. Talbot is making images by using silver chloride. In the production of making what he called photogenic drawings, which are essentially just coating paper with salt, coating paper with silver nitrate, and place a fern or objects on top of the paper. Put a piece of glass on top of that and lay it in the sunlight. It will darken. Up to that point, it's not so much different than what Wedgwood did. But Niepce and Wedgwood could not figure out a way to keep the drawings. What Talbot discovers is that if he takes that image and puts it into a stronger solution of salt water, all the areas that were not exposed to light, all the areas that didn't turn to metallic silver become less sensitive. They are not removed completely, but he can show them to people in the house. You can see them by candlelight. This is the type of camera that Talbot used in his earliest experiments with photogenic drawing. Many of them are still around, and you can see them as long as you don't bring them out into too much light. Usually when you see them, they're sort of under a piece of velvet. So it feels like this intimate experience of looking at a photograph in its first days. Now photography is so ubiquitous that we probably don't think about how special and magical that experience was. Talbot is the first person to make a salted paper print. He actually invents something that's permanent. It's basically his photogenic drawing process that has been fixed with hypo. Sodium thiosulfate is the modern term. Its potential of removing silver halide is discovered by Sir John Herschel. Salted paper prints, because of the way they are made, where the image material sinks into the paper, tend to have a less crisp look to them. There was sort of this dichotomy between the crisp, clean, almost three-dimensional quality of the daguerreotype and the, the softer, almost more granulated sensibility of the salted paper print. So that sort of got reduced to information versus artistry in the early years of photography's history. Talbot improves the photogenic drawing process by switching from silver chloride to silver iodide, the same silver halide that Daguerre uses in his process. The latent image calotype process that he invents in 1840 allows him to make a little bit of an exposure, and then he develops out the invisible image to a visible image using gallic acid. And so now he can put this into a camera and actually do pictures of living human beings. He can then make photographic negatives. And after those negatives are fixed with hypo, he can then place those on top of a second sheet of sensitive paper, expose that to light, and now he makes a positive proof. So he has negative 
and positive. He essentially introduces the negative positive potential for photography that becomes the standard of photography until the, uh, the invention of digital photography. The rivalry between Daguerre and Talbot continues today. There are champions of Talbot and the champions of Daguerre. Uh, both camps feel that their man invented photography. In fact, it's all photography, just a different type. After Talbot figured out this negative-positive process, he wanted to show what photography could do. So his way to do that was to produce a series of publications called The Pencil of Nature. The Pencil of Nature contains text explaining Talbot's process. It contains salted paper prints, uh, mostly showing Talbot's home at Laycock Abbey. And each of the photographs is meant to display one of the various uses of photography. Talbot's showing the reproducibility of the photograph, which really became one of the most important aspects of the medium. Sir John Herschel was the scientific superstar of the 19th century. Herschel is the man who could have invented photography if he'd been bothered to. He's the one that Talbot goes to to find out how to fix his images permanently. And as Herschel is dabbling, he invents the cyanotype as well. Sir John Herschel was an astronomer and scientist uh, working around the same time as Talbot in England. Once he heard about the invention of photography, he decided to figure it out for himself and he came up with a cyanotype process. Herschel invented the process after Daguerre had already announced his own process, after Talbot had announced his process. Cyanotype is a very interesting process. It's a non-silver process. Most of the photographic processes used throughout the 19th and 20th century are silver-based. Herschel comes up with a process that produces a permanent blue and white image based on the salts of iron. And while there are many variants of the process, essentially it's, it's two chemicals. You take a potassium ferrocyanide and ferric ammonium citrate, and when you combine these two chemicals, you produce uh, a compound that if you brush this on paper, and allow it to dry, you put them in contact with your negative, place them in the sun, it will turn color when it's exposed to light. And so it's kind of a latent image process. There's, there are elements of printing out because you actually see a printed out image on the paper, but it, it really comes to life when you put the paper into just plain old water. It turns bright blue. It doesn't get much use in the 1840s, with the exception of maybe botanicals. It was utilized very early on by a British woman who was the daughter of a friend of Herschel's named Anna Atkins. She was doing a record of botanicals that were placed on this paper as a way of, of keeping a record without having to draw. 
She then published several series of books of botanical specimens, and those are really the first photographically illustrated publications. It gives you this really rich blue, intense color. I think it sort of takes it out of the vernacular, it takes it out of everyday life and makes, it, it makes us look at it a little bit differently. Cyanotype is, is invented by Herschel in the very beginning of photography, but really doesn't see any use until the end of the 19th century. It started being used in engineering applications. It became what we now know as the blueprint. The blueprint really found its way all the way into the 21st century. The other way of using the cyanotype process was to make very cheap photographs from gelatin silver negatives. It was utilized by many photographers to do test prints or contact sheets as a proofing material. The most common cyanotype you'll find are the, the images that are made by college students in the 1880s, 1890s. So most of the, the cyanotypes we see in collections tend to be done by amateurs. Up until photography, only the very wealthy who could afford to have portraits painted had any notion of what their ancestors looked like. Photography was used primarily for portraits because people is what we are primarily interested in. We see it as a very popular way to do what we've always wanted to do, which is to record the features of people we love. I'm going to show you a collodion negative on glass. I'm just going to take that out here very carefully. This process was invented in 1851 by Frederick Scott Archer. In the 1850s, you had the daguerreotype, you had the calotype paper negative. The daguerreotype was a commercial success. The plate that they hand the customer is the same plate that was in the camera. There's no negative. What you got with the calotype was a negative, and it was a negative that could be reproduced very easily. You could print dozens, even hundreds, of positive prints from that negative. But it made a very soft photograph. It was much less sensitive than the, the daguerreotype. You couldn't do portraits easily with that process. The desire was to have the reproducibility of a positive-negative process with the precision and detail of the daguerreotype. But in 1851, Frederick Scott Archer invented a process called the wet collodion process. The wet plate process can give you a negative to make paper prints. It can give you a direct positive plate called an ambrotype and another direct positive plate called a tintype. When you do the wet plate process, you make a glass negative, and that glass negative can then be contact printed onto various printing processes and make thousands and thousands of prints. By the time you get to the late 1850s, really replaces the daguerreotype. The positive negative process won out, in part because it was more economically viable. It it does require some advanced planning when you're taking it on the road. You have to have a portable darkroom. You pour the collodion on the plate, you dip it in the silver bath, and while it's dripping wet with silver nitrate, 
you take the picture, come back, and develop it, and you have to do all of that before the plate dries. And so the people that made landscape images, they had to carry a wagon with all of their chemicals. It was a challenge. So you can see on this negative the pore marks, which are characteristic of the wet clothing process. See this kind of wave up here that's a pore mark from when the photographer poured the developer onto the glass. The camera that, that took this photograph would have had to have been quite large in order to accommodate a negative of this size. You could do a lot of things with collodion besides make a negative. You could back it with black paper or black cloth, and you ended up with a positive. These kinds of photographs, they were called ambrotypes, were generally cased and presented in the same way that uh, daguerreotypes were. You could expose a positive onto a metal plate, and for funny reasons, these were called tin types, even though they weren't made on tin. Tin types were one of the earliest truly democratic kinds of photography. During the American Civil War, we see hundreds, thousands of tin type images made by soldiers to send a picture home. This is a Lewis, uh, H.B. Lewis wet plate camera, it's basically your, your typical Civil War portrait camera. So it's a camera that the tin types of the soldiers would have been made of. Photography shaped the way we remember things. It's a really important cultural change, no longer through ballads and poems and stories, but through looking at a likeness is the way we remember what happened and who was. When the albumin print was invented in 1850, they then called salted paper prints plain prints. The only difference is one has egg white and one does not. It's the same process. So these are examples of albumin prints. The albumin print was invented in 1850 by Louis Desiree Blancart Evrard and was the most popular photographic process in the 19th century. This is an example of a pristine albumin print, how it would have looked when it was first produced. This is an example of a faded yellowed albumin print, characteristic of albumin deterioration. The albumin print is a silver chloride process. It's, it uses table salt as, as part of its process. All it is is paper that's been floated on a solution of albumin, egg white. The earliest albumin printing operations literally kept a lot of chickens because it took a lot of eggs to make a lot of albumin print. You, you take eggs and you separate the white from the yolk. You beat the white, and when it settles back down again, you have this, this beautiful yellow liquid. In the liquid, there's sodium chloride or salt. You float the paper on that, and when the paper's dry, it's a nice, shiny surface. The paper's then floated, after it's dry, on silver nitrate. And when the silver nitrate and the chloride combine, you get photographic paper. What you finally have is a cheap and comparatively easy way of preparing paper for making a photograph using a negative that may have been produced by any number of processes. So a collodion negative could be printed as an albumin print. You would have your negative and you would place it in contact with the sensitized paper 
and exposed in the sunlight. The thing that distinguishes an albumin print from a salted paper print or a platinum print is that the image is suspended on a layer above the paper rather than being embedded in the paper fibers, creating a much more precise and crisp image. This is when we see the rise of the great industrial photographic houses producing popular photographs of tourist sites. Even then, we're beginning to think if you don't have a photograph of it, you didn't really experience it. It was the beginning of really aggressive mass marketing and mass production of photographs for general consumption. And this was the predominant printing paper from 1850 to about 1890. People like Frith produced photographically illustrated Bibles where he photographed the sites in the 19th century where things that were told about in the Bible were said to have happened. We begin to see how really as early as the 1870s and 80s, the photograph becomes a really important, not just conveyor of knowledge and information, but a shaper of knowledge and information. And it's the album and print that made that possible because it was precise, it was detailed, it was cheap, and it could be mass produced and distributed easily. The platinum print comes at the same time that the albumin print is the most commercially successful process, but they're very different. The platinum print is a matte finished print. It's a neutral color, meaning it's more black looking. The platinum print comes as an attempt to elevate photography as a fine art. The platinum print was invented in 1873 by William Willis and Alfred Clement. It involves using platinum metal. Although there are manufactured papers, oftentimes you see very beautiful brush strokes on the paper that surround the image. That's an effect of literally brushing the chemistry onto the paper. Museums often map those out, but when I get to look at a print in the archive, I open up the mat and I see those brush strokes and I go, ah, it's a platinum print. It has to be a platinum print. To me, it's something really beautiful. So these are examples of platinum prints. This is an example of a contemporary photograph made by Craig Barber, and you can see the brush strokes which show where he's coated the paper with the chemicals. It's a contact printing process. So you produce the negative, to whatever size you want the final print to be. You would place it in contact with the sensitized paper and expose in the sunlight. And after exposure, a faint image would appear. Once you place the photograph in the developer, the image is fully realized. This is a platinum print by Frederick Evans, who was a master of the process. I think one of the most beautiful examples of a platinum print you can see the characteristics of the process. It has a matte finish and a very long tonal range. Frederick Evans was an esthete. They called themselves pictorialists and made beautiful photographs. The pictorialists were looking for something that was not garish, something that was more painterly. The image sits in the paper rather than on the paper. Platinum gives you a broader tonal range than any other process, even digital today, I would argue. The platinum print is often called the king of photographic prints. It is regal because of the metals. They're called noble metals, gold, platinum. Not everybody can do this process because it's very expensive. And it actually dies out 
around World War I because they need platinum for the war effort. But one of the things about the platinum print that's very special is that it's a very permanent print. Platinum prints don't fade. They may yellow on the highlights because of bad processing, but the image never fades.
One of the major themes in photography is this desire to have a more permanent image. You have the Woodbury type, you have the platinum print, very stable, very long lasting processes. And then you also have the pigment family of processes, the gum bichromate process and the carbon print process. The gum print is based on the light sensitivity of chromium. Mungo Ponton is the first person to really do experiments with the light sensitivity of this compound. Talbot himself experiments with chromium salts. He discovers that if you mix them with colloids, gelatin or, or gum, they harden when they're exposed to sunlight. Based on the work of Talbot, it doesn't take too much time for people to figure out that if we take a colloid like uh, gum arabic and we put pigment into those and then we sensitize those with chromium salts, we now have a medium that can be brushed onto paper, exposed to light under a negative. When we put this piece of paper in warm water, areas that are struck by light will harden and that's where the dark pigment will be and areas that are not struck by light will dissolve away, leaving the white of the paper. And so now we have a brand new printing process based on chromium. If you look at a gum print, the darker the picture, the thicker the deposit of gum. And the whiter the picture, the more you're getting towards the actual paper. So the image itself will have slight relief. One of the names that's associated with gum printing and, and carbon printing is Alphonse Poitvin, a Frenchman who perfects certain elements of chromium printing. While it's imperfect, is the seed to an improvement that's later done by Joseph Swan that results in this, this process we now call carbon printing. It's essentially a, a piece of paper that's coated with gelatin that is bearing pigment. This thing is called the tissue. It's, it's not tissue-like at all. It feels like a piece of plastic. The tissue is sensitized with chromium, is contact printed with a negative. The light striking the gelatin hardens the gelatin selectively. That tissue now is put into cold water. A second piece of paper bearing clear gelatin on the surface is put in contact with the tissue they're slid into a tray with hot water. The unhardened gelatin with pigment ooze out the edges. Uh, it's softening because of the hot water. You peel off the original tissue and by washing it in, in hot water, you then take away all the black that you don't need in order to get a continuous tone photograph. The image itself is, is very, very permanent. It's still being done today. Uh, there are still people making carbon prints today. Pictorialists really established photography as a fine art form. So they used things like the gum bichromate process or platinum prints that involved a lot of handwork um, and craftsmanship. So you really had a sense of the photographic object as something that was made by somebody. Alfred Stieglitz is the person who is most associated with um, what was called the photo secession. He and Edward Steichen actually um, co-founded the movement and they promoted this idea through a publication called Camera Work. Um, Stieglitz had a gallery called 291 in New York that showed photography as an art form. This is a camera that was used by Alfred Stieglitz. It was given to the museum by George O'Keefe in the 1950s. The opening of that lens determines the sharpness of the picture. If you open it up quite a ways, you get an image that's kind of soft in the edges. And he was interested in what we call pictorialist photography, and this was a lens that was designed to do that. Stieglitz and Steichen and Kasebier wanted people to take photography seriously as an art form not just an automatic activity that produced um, images without anybody's intervention. 
I think what the argument was really about was where is the creative input of the artist in photography. And that's a theme that goes back to the invention of the medium. <laughs>